Hi. Uh, well, firstly, thank you for all the presentations so far. They've been so inspiring. Um, um, and it is just me representing the big team that you may have met, Caitlin and Rosie, uh, yesterday. Um, so from the US, we moved to the UK. Um, and I'm going to tell you about a project that had a starting point was that the professionals in the arts were about to maybe face unprecedented and urgent challenges to their health, well-being and livelihoods as a result of COVID-19. Uh, the work I'll be talking about today is part of a bigger AHRC funded project that's called Hearts Professional, the health, economic, social impact of COVID-19 on professionals in the arts. Um, now that's not to say that uh, everything was new with COVID-19. In fact, the challenges that we'd seen uh, during COVID-19 weren't new, uh, at least many of them. Uh, and this project followed on previous work that had happened at the Royal College of Music, where, where most of the people on this project are based. There'd been a research project called Musical Impact that investigated the demands of music making with the aim of enhancing musicians' health and well-being. There had been a healthy conservatoire network set up with, with the aim of inspiring and creating educational professional environments that promoted health and well-being. Uh, and there was Hearts, which had investigated the impact of the arts and culture on health and well-being from individual social and economic perspectives. That was more looking at people on the uh, audience side of, of things. And as part of Hearts, we created a survey that looked at connections between engagement in the arts and culture on one hand and health and well-being outcomes on the other. Now, when COVID began, uh, we began a large scale survey in the arts and culture sector to determine precisely where the challenges lie and how they evolve in, uh, in, as the situation changed. Um, and the survey that we, we developed really used a lot of the health and well-being measured that we'd used previously in that heart survey I just mentioned. Um, our purpose with this whole project is to be helpful to professional in the arts. So if you see ways in which this work can be used for good or comparison or whatever <laughs> might be helpful for you, do let me know. Um, we know now from other large scale studies that the impact of COVID has been swift and pretty dramatic. Uh, in the UK context in 2019, the music industry contributed 5.8 billion pounds to the UK economy. And in 2020, that dropped to um, by 46% to 3.1 billion. Um, so an overall employment in the music industry dropped by 35% from 2019 to 2020. Uh, at the start of COVID, we worried and feared that uh, COVID would affect arts professionals, but we didn't know how, how or exactly or what that would look like. Um, and so we started asking people using this survey. Uh, we wanted to cast the net pretty wide. Uh, we wanted to look outside music, which is my um, <laughs> usual domain, and look at a range of arts professionals. Um, and in addition to the health and well-being questions that I mentioned earlier, we asked about people's work, income, COVID, uh, and some open questions. And so in phase one of this survey, which took place in April to June 2020, we contacted individuals and organisations using and used social media. Um, it was all, as everybody experienced at the time, pretty rushed. Um, and we published findings uh, from, from that first phase uh, earlier this year. And then a year later, um, in the UK context, things began to unlock a little bit. And so in April to May 2021, we recontacted the participants that we'd um, reached out to in the first phase and also contacted new participants. Um, and so that was our phase two of data collection. Um, we kept the survey broadly the same, but we added some questions about long COVID and vaccination. Um, and we also added a new question about the future. Do you anticipate a future for yourself working in the arts and cultural sectors? Um, in this phase, we were a bit more um, sorted in terms of uh, reaching people. So we used an online platform called Prolific. Um, and today uh, I'll focus mainly on the results from phase two, but put them in the context of phase one. Um, and uh, all of this is talking about data that we collected in the UK. 
We could ask several questions from our data set, but here we'll focus on two. Uh, one is what are the relationships between performing arts professionals pro profiles and measures of their mental and social well-being? And the other is what predicts performing artists seeing themselves as having a future in the arts? So who were our participants? Um, for the second phase, we had um, over 80% new participants. So even though it's the same questionnaire, it's primarily new people. Uh, the second time round, we managed a notch better spread in some of our categories, uh, but still over two thirds were female, a little bit younger than before, average age 38 years old, uh, slightly smaller percentage of people identifying themselves as white, uh, slightly lower proportion of um, the graduates um, and a slightly higher proportion of people testing positive for COVID. Um, um, and in terms of the arts areas they, they worked in, um, the first time around we had real concentration on music and performing arts. The second time we managed a better spread. Um, excuse the bin lorry outside my house. Um, had about 30% now in music and sound arts, about 30% performing arts, um, nearly half visual and decorative arts and only 11% um, literature. Um, so what did we find? Well, in answer to the question, do you consider to yourself to be in financial hardship as a result of the pandemic, 54% uh, had said yes in phase one, and this rose to 59% in phase two. Uh, we can break that down by professional area. The keen-eyed among you will see that now we've broken visual arts and decorative arts decorative arts down into crafts, decorative arts and visual arts. And that's possible only for phase two where we have a better for better spread, but still the numbers in some of these categories get pretty low. Uh, the numbers at the top uh, of each bar there show how many people identified in each group. Uh, and people could pick more than one. So you can be a, a crafts professional and a decorative arts professional, and then you'd show up here. Um, so we can still see though that there's quite a thread in, in people in how people consider themselves or the extent to which people consider themselves in financial hardship. So 75% of the 126 respondents who reported working purely in performing arts saw themselves as being in financial hardship as a result of the pandemic, while only 30% of the 47 people working in literature saw themselves in financial hardship as a result of the pandemic. Um, there can be lots of factors affecting these differences. Um, we have a, an author on our research team who, who, uh, who's explained um, a bigger context for perhaps for some of these, these that we can talk about in the quest injection if we, if we like, because um, there's a lot under this, these numbers, I think. Uh, but with that sobering background in mind, to address the first question, uh, which was to look at relationship between performing arts professionals profiles and measures of mental and social well-being, we did regressions. Um, and in terms of profiles, we looked at three groups of variables. The first were pandemic specific, so exercise change compared with pre-COVID, reporting of financial hardship and changes in socialising. Then we had demographics and health, so gender, ethnicity, and so on, self-rated health and, and exercise pre-COVID. And then we had finance um, and work questions, household income, percent of work coming from freelance work and so on. So we'll look at the summary of associations that we see in the regressions. Um, so our outcome variables are at the top. So how people are scoring on well-being, a well-being scale called the mental health continuum, short form, a depression scale, a social connectedness scale, and a loneliness scale. And then down the side, we have the key variables that we're exploring, the extent to which they contribute to the people's scores on these outcomes. Um, as we go through the table, an upward arrow is a positive association and a downward one is a negative. But sometimes up is what we'd want to see and sometimes down. So mental health scores and social connectedness, if we see a positive association, uh, that, that would be something that we'd be looking for. And if we see a reduction in a depression score, a reduction in loneliness score and a, ne and a negative association there, then that's a, a, a positive. 
Uh, if the arrows are reversed and we're getting a more negative outcome, they'll show up in red. But generally speaking, there's a lot of green here. Um, so we find in our phase one, so right at the beginning of the pandemic, um, that more rather than less exercise before COVID was connected to positive mental and social measures and reduced levels of loneliness. More exercise during COVID compared to before was connected to better outcomes across all measures. 10 minutes. Be thank you. Better self-rated health was associated with better outcomes for mental and ill health. Worse financial situation was connected to worse outcomes on mental, well and ill health and low loneliness. Old, older age was connected to better outcomes across all measures and nothing came up, excuse me, nothing came up um, as significant for changes in socialising. Changes in socialising does become significant um, in phase two uh, for mental health and social connectedness. Um, and that might, might be connected timing to timing. We're a year further into more or less restricted lives at this point. Health becomes significant across the board. Um, but overall, we're very consistent with phase one. There are a few other associations that come up as significant. Gender associated with depression, living alone with loneliness. But here we're focusing only those, with those that come out across uh, at more than one outcome measure. So generally speaking, greater physical activity before lockdown, increase in physical activity during lockdown, better self-rated health, not being in financial hardship as a result of COVID and older age, not having a reduction in socialising are all associated with better outcomes. Turning to our second research question, what predicts performing artists seeing themselves as having a future in the arts? In response to the question, do you anticipate a future for yourself in the arts and cultural sector? A very small proportion said no, but that might be a selection bias. It's a long survey. Why would you fill it in if you're leaving the profession anyway? Um, almost 30% are saying not at the moment or maybe, but looking at the glass, 70% fall, 70% are saying yes, they do anticipate a future for themselves working in the arts and cultural sectors. And to look at what might be predicting these responses, we did another regression. Uh, we did these very, we added these variables in groups. So model one has health and well-being variables. Model two has, adds finances and employment. Model three adds demographics and model four adds, adds art specialism. Um, and this time uh, predicting variables are in green. So the things that are coming out are significant. In model one, so if we just had these, we see association between higher scores on well-being and connection to others in the arts on one hand and being more confident of the future in the arts. However, when we introduce uh, model two, that overrides all of this uh, and primary drivers uh, become the degree to which people are already uh, seeing high percentage of their income via the arts before the pandemic. Um, percentage of income from freelance and maintaining current skills. So that might be something to do with just being able to keep keep going in these very practical ways. Um, models three and four don't contribute to the model, whichever order we add them in. So as a simple story, maybe the best predicted anticipated um, best predictors of anticipated future in the arts is financial and perhaps connected to opportunities. So in summary, um, the mental and social well-being models seem to be replicable even under different circumstances, a year into the pandemic and with an expanded sample with new participants and broadening out the range of participants. So it seems that these outcome measures, uh, the four well-being measures that I talked about, seem to be resistant to the circumstances. So that kind of strengthens the validity and reliability of the models. Uh, but the situations in 20 and 21 aren't identical. We see the roles, increased roles of general health and social connection for well-being. And we see the importance of financial consideration for anticipation of staying in the profession. So we collected much more data. It's a very long survey, plenty more to look at. Um, at the very least, we're going to be one notch more fine grained in our descriptives and about the specialisms looking at what, what people are actually doing I, I can imagine that there's a difference between whether you were teaching or performing at the start of COVID primarily uh, the survey also used 
both closed and open questions about finance and support, which uh, One Rosie and Caitlin were working on. Thank you. Uh, we won't be talking about that today, but uh, I think we've got an opportunity here to make those comparisons. Uh, and most obviously, in terms of the new data, it seems to me that we need to keep tracking what happens in a consistent sample over time. Um, so that we can we can begin continue to track how things are going for people and what might be helpful or not so helpful for them. Those are some images of the broader team that's mainly based at the Royal College of Music, but also at University of Arts London and Imperial College London and associated with different partners in the arts and culture sector in the UK. Thank you to our participants, to the HRC for funding this, to you. Uh, we are at early stages of um, analyzing this second set of data. So if you have any questions, suggestions, connections, I'd gladly hear them. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nata. That was really insightful and um, very extensive. You, you got a lot of participants there to get some really robust data as well. So um, yeah, fantastic. I've got some thoughts myself, but I'll throw it out to the floor. So do we have any questions from our audience at all? You can grab the microphone or stick up your hand. No? Well, my question is, uh, um, and forgive me if I didn't hear this at the very beginning, how long are you wanting to have this study to go for? Do you have a three-year or five-year plan of 2022, 23, 24, 25? Forever. That, that's a good <laughs> that's a good question I mean this this project started because of COVID but it feels a bit like it could go on and on right like and with especially the way it's set up there's a kind of there are set sections and then there are questions particularly open questions that we can switch in and out and it would still the rest would, I think would still be more or less valid um so the grant would allow us one more round of data collection which I'm planning to do at, at the same time point again in 2022 yeah um, but I can see if we get follow-on funding trying to continue because I don't think this is over yet <laughs> <laughs> professionals um, so it'd be interesting to keep tracking people yeah yeah definitely and um I guess probably something that's going through my head is that the the music community or the arts community in general is getting noisier and noisier and there is some some minute but some uh, influence of policy on on government um, and the idea is also not so much uh, although I remember reading one paper very very recently saying um, it was Australian authors I believe saying um, yes uh, what they found was Australian musicians yes they're very happy to gain any kind of financial support whatsoever however it doesn't in a COVID environment uh, money does not replace hope put it that way um, and so the policy should actually sort of shift to create uh, different kinds of incentives for audience members to basically uptake or just be encouraged or incentivized to uh, patronize music, arts, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that would actually build um, a, a healthier ecology of arts appreciation and then also be um, centrally uh, assist the musician in their own identity etc cetera, etc cetera. so all that kind of thing my question with a study like this um, is I guess is there a capability to um, still factor in those kinds of shifts I suppose and yet still have the comparable data from every year or do you have to reinvent the wheel from each year because I noticed you said oh there was just some slight shifts in we asked a different kind of question for the second year and I'll just imagine it's just a changing animal. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And I think that the point about it's not just the money um, is, is really fundamental here as well. To, to your question first and then to going on and on on the tangent. Um, uh, yes, we can, we can adapt. Um, I think we can switch in specific questions and then keep others consistent. So the well-being I measures I mentioned are all standardized measures. Um, and a lot of the demographics and that kind of thing are taken based on census and, and other kind of questions. So there's a bunch of questions that are 
formulated in that I would look to see to keep completely consistent. And then there would be others that I would um, look to change. And that would be in two forms, I think. One is we're very careful with every survey to have open questions to let people just tell us about their experiences. And that in itself then informs follow-up questions and studies and respons the responsive work in the rest of the bigger funded project. And then some closed questions like the finance one or in your case, in the case that you're giving an example of, you know, to do with audience, to do with encouragement, to do with what would you, what message would you like about the arts? Like I could completely see how that would be really relevant. Um, and I think in terms of, of, of kind of putting together a, the kinds of um, what we learn from things, I think there is a lot to do with policy. Um, and then there's also just a little bit to do with kind of um, that balance between just pointing out really things that we saw about connections between exercise and, and well-being say um uh, and having that that kind of balance there as well so it's a, it's a rich little little survey i think in that sense yeah that was um, brilliant well done thank you so much um that was really informative and it's just so great to see such fresh data as well so yeah good luck with more of the distilling that um, in, in the future. And we look forward to hearing more about the next iteration as well. So thank you so much, Nate, for, for sharing. That was, that was brilliant. Thank you so much.